The following Lighthouse Talk is distributed by the Augustan Institute, whose mission is to help you understand, live, and share your faith. To order additional copies of this presentation, browse our selection of over 300 inspiring titles in English and Spanish, or receive more information on becoming an Augustan Institute Parish Consultant or Emissary to help answer the Holy Father's call for a new evangelization please visit our website at www.augustaninstitute.org forward slash talks or call us toll free at 866-526-2151. The son of a Protestant minister and a former evangelical missionary, Matthew Leonard converted to the Catholic faith in 1998. He is currently the executive director of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology in Steubenville, Ohio, and the presenter of the Journey Through Scripture DVD series, a dynamic parish-based Bible study program. Matthew holds a master's in theology from Franciscan University and is an internationally known Catholic speaker and the author of several books, including Louder Than Words, The Art of Living as a Catholic and Prayer Works, getting a grip on Catholic spirituality. Using scripture and the great riches of Catholic tradition, he focuses on deep prayer and the interior life, inspiring Catholics to become saints. For more from Matthew, visit his website at www.matthewsleonard.com. And now, here's Matthew Leonard. It's great to be Catholic, amen? This is the best. And as I'm sure many of you have undoubtedly heard on many occasions, we have a divine destiny as Catholics. Our final end, provided we make it through this world in a state of grace, is to be nothing less than sons and daughters of Almighty God. So in an act of unprecedented love, this is what God does for us. He offers us a share in his divine nature. We become partakers of the divine nature, says 2 Peter 1.4. It's a mind-blowing thing. Now, we don't become omniscient, omnipresent, or omnipotent because, well, we remain creatures, right? We're not God. But he invites us to be sons and daughters in his divine family. That is your created destiny, if you accept it. That's what we're all working for here, right? Now, a lot of us maybe haven't realized that this growth toward perfection, this growth to divinity is something that doesn't just happen later. We don't live two lives, one now and one later. There's one life to live. It's not just a bad soap opera. This is your life, okay? <laughs> and we're not meant to muddle around in the muck of this world, kind of treading water, going, oh, I hope to God I stay in a state of grace before Jesus comes the second time. That's not what it's all about. We're supposed to be making a move toward perfection right now. And I think one of the strongest and craziest statements that Jesus Christ made was in Matthew 5:48. And he said, be perfect, even as your heavenly father is perfect. And some of us are like, Jesus, do you know who you're talking to here? Do you know who my first parents are? I mean, they got it really wrong and they passed this on to me. So what's the deal here? How does this perfection actually take place? What does it look like? How do we define the perfection that Jesus Christ is talking about? Well, St. Thomas Aquinas says that something becomes perfect in a sense when it achieves the end for which it was made. So, for example, a seed becomes perfected when it becomes a tree. A tadpole finds its end when it becomes a frog. A pig eventually turns into bacon. All right? <laughs> that is its created divine destiny on my plate. Well, it's the same with us. We were made for one thing. We are perfected when we become divine. That's what you were created for. And you cannot be perfect until you achieve this union with God. So life essentially boils down to a journey to God. You're going to meet him one way or the other. And it's going to be a good meeting where he welcomes us into his presence, or it's going to be a bad meeting because he rejects us because we rejected him with the way that we lived our lives. So every day, guys, we make choices. And these choices either move us closer to God or further away. We're in constant motion here. Echoing Augustine, the Protestant martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, there are no plateaus in the spiritual life. 
you're either moving forward or you are sliding backwards. And what this tells us then is that there is a path to God. There is a right way to go, and you're not going to find him unless you're going the right way. And that's what I want to focus on right now. I want to give you a GPS to God. How badly do we need our GPSs? How did we ever find anything before we had those? A friend of mine was driving around in Ireland a few years ago, and he got hopelessly lost. If you've ever been to Ireland, particularly Southern Ireland, you realize after a while it all looks the same. It's all this rolling hills and little stone fences and a couple of sheep buying off in the distance. And everywhere you look, it looks like a hill that Mel Gibson could come running over the top of with a big broadsword and blue face paint screaming, freedom! So this guy gets lost and he sees this elderly gentleman walking down the side of the road. And so he pulls up to him and he explains his situation. The old man says, well, you could go up here and take a... No, that's not going to work. I'll tell you what, instead of going that way, go the other way when you get to that inter... Well, that's not going to work either. Listen, go back the way you came. And he pauses and says, I'm sorry, Sonny. You just can't get there from here. <laughs> and that's the way we feel sometimes in the spiritual life, right? We know we're supposed to get to God, but we don't know exactly how. So we need a map. We need a spiritual GPS. And if you don't have one, you're left driving in spiritual circles sometimes. There's this little voice next to you saying, recalculating. I hate that voice. So what I want to tell you is that Catholic doctrine, Catholic tradition provide for us this map. And what it shows is that there are definite stages in our journey to God. So we are headed toward a specific destination and there is a specific path laid out for us and realize I'm not just talking about going to daily mass and confession as often as you can and having a life of prayer. That's the vehicle but the vehicle has to travel the right path. And when you're in the right vehicle and you're on the right path, now you're going to experience a transformation that leads to perfection. And this transformation is what a lot of the spiritual writers call the science of sainthood. So it's the movement of each person in this life toward God. And it's not a random or haphazard road. It's not like driving around in Ireland. You can get there from here. In fact, you are made to get there from here. So the spiritual writers say there are three distinct stages through which we move in order to achieve our union with God. We sometimes say we're made in the image and likeness of God. Technically speaking, that's not really true. Adam and Eve were made in the image and likeness of God. They lost their likeness to God through sin. The whole Catholic life is all about getting this likeness back. That's what these stages of the spiritual life do for us. This is that process of reacquiring our likeness. Now, maps, GPSs, they all come in different shapes and sizes and colors. And it's the same with the charisms of the Catholic faith. I cannot hope to go through all the different methods and descriptions of the movement toward God through the spiritual stages in one talk. So what I want to focus on are the traditional stages that you see throughout Catholic millennia. The backbone of this talk are what the spiritual writers call the three stages or three ages of the spiritual life. And they are the purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive ways. Now, some of you are thinking, the hoodive and the whatative? Man, I've been Catholic since before I was conceived. I've never heard of these things. I didn't hear about these, frankly, until I've been a Catholic for 10 years. But these are basically the classic stages of the spiritual life that you see in the saints like Teresa of Avila. John of the Cross, Francis de Sales, Thomas Aquinas, etc., etc. Now you can summarize the stages like this. Our lives need to be purged of mortal sin and vice. That's the purgative way, the initial stage. Secondly, we are then illuminated by the light and love of God in the second stage, the illuminative way. And then we are illuminated to the point where we achieve union with God in the unitive stage. Now echoing origin... St. Thomas Aquinas gives us a little more human description of these stages. He says that you start out as a spiritual child, and then you move into spiritual adolescence, and then spiritual adulthood. Others will talk about it as beginners, proficients, and perfect, because it's moving toward perfection. Now, why do we care about these three stages of the spiritual life? Why are they so important to us? Well, they give us an idea of where we are in the spiritual life. 
You got to know where you are before you can know where it is you're going. So these spiritual stages, it's like a you are here map. You know, you pull off of I-80 and you go into the rest stop and there's the you are here map. That's what the spiritual stages, that's one of the things that they are so important to us. That's what they accomplish. So let's talk about this initial stage, the spiritual life, the purgative way. Now, some of you are thinking, man, the purgative way, Matt, that doesn't sound so great. Like it sounds like something along the lines of a spiritual colon cleanse. That's not far off base. You know those people are taking like those supplements. I'm going to cleanse. You don't want to hang out with those people, right? That's kind of what this is about. But you know you cannot get healthy until you have purged yourself of the diseases that are bringing you down. You get into the purgative way in one of two ways. Baptism, or once you've lost your baptismal innocence, through confession. So these are the sacraments that are set up by God to bring us into or restore us to a life of grace. If you are not in a state of grace, you are not even in the purgative way. It assumes that you are in right relationship with God through the sacraments. And in this initial stage of the spiritual life, what you start to discover is that the person starts to recognize things about themselves. They start to grow. So they're not just learning about God. They're taking a hard look at themselves. You know how babies, I've got an 18 month old. And so, you know, a few months ago, we went through this stage where he discovers that his hands and his feet are connected to his body, right? And he's like, whoa, man, look at that. That's what it's like for a spiritual child as well. So your faults start to become evident to you. Your spiritual poverty starts to make itself known to us in this stage. And you start to get this increasing knowledge of God, and this helps instill in you a fear that keeps you out of mortal sin, at least attempts to keep you out of mortal sin. Now, a couple of days ago, we celebrated the Feast of St. Teresa of Avila, one of my favorite saints. And I think that she has the best description, probably the clearest description of a soul's movement toward God in this development, easiest to visualize. And of course, St. Teresa is a Spanish mystic, doctor of the church, one of the greatest spiritual writers in the history of the church. And in her most famous work, The Interior Castle, she really eloquently describes the growth of the person toward God using the imagery of a castle. So Teresa has this vision from our Lord, and she sees the human soul as this crystal globe at the center of this castle. And there are seven different mansions inside, right? The interior castle. Now these rooms, these mansions in this castle are not arranged the way you think in a linear fashion, one after the other, after the other, after the other. Rather, she says, some are above, some are below. And in the center and midst of them all, she says, is the chiefest mansion where the most secret things pass between God and the soul. Now each of the mansions get successively brighter because all of them are illuminated by the king of glory, she says, who resides in the center of the seventh mansion here. Now, outside of the castle, she says, is darkness. It's awful. It's infested by all kinds of terribly foul and awful creatures like toads and vipers and other venomous creatures. And that darkness represents the world of sin that a soul escapes when it enters into the spiritual life, a life of grace joined to Christ. But interestingly, in Teresa's description, you can be in a state of grace. You can be in the purgative way and not have gone into your interior castle. So everybody's got one, not everybody goes in. And those who don't go in, she says, are hanging around outside with the guards, you know, in the darkness. But she says, when they do enter, when they go into the castle, when they open the door and they go in, some of the little poisonous beasties, she says, slide in the door with them. Now, how do you get inside your castle? Teresa says a soul gets inside their interior castle through prayer, particularly through meditation. You have to remember that prayer is always vitally important for all the spiritual writers. You cannot overestimate its importance to your growth to God. Teresa says that a soul without prayer is like a paralytic. So you have arms and legs, but tragically you can't move them. You cannot get to God if you are not praying. This is why one of the pillars of the catechism is on prayer. So we have to learn how to pray. You're just not going to make it to God. Now, how does Teresa describe those of us in the initial stage? 
Well, shockingly, she says, those of us who first enter into the purgative way are overly concerned and consumed with ourselves. Does that sound familiar? Even so, she says, your desire is good. So you want to grow. You think about making spiritual growth. You might even set some time aside during the day to say some prayers. So while you're still battling with all little poisonous beasties who slipped in the door with you, at least you're on the right path to God. Now, these souls in this initial stage can still make deadly choices. You can still fall flat on your face. And Teresa hammers over and over and over how awful mortal sin is. And she wants to instill in us this fear of ever offending God. And she says, look, a soul never loses its splendor in a sense because God is everywhere, right? And he's always there. But she says a soul in a state of mortal sin can produce nothing but filth grime, awfulness, blackness. And she wants us to never, ever do this to our Lord. O souls, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, remove the pitch which blackens the crystal, she says. And mortal sin is still very much a real danger in the initial mansions of your interior castle. Because remember, the devil has legions of fallen angels who are doing their very best to prevent you from progressing through the mansions, from finding your way to God. And remember, the devil's the most envious of creatures. And notice I didn't say jealous. Jealousy wants what someone else has. Envy wants to deprive the other person of what they have. The devil does not want you to have life. He wants to kill you. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness. So this is all very serious. Satan is going to do whatever he can to keep you from attaining union with God because he hates you. He loathes you. Be sober and vigilant. Your opponent, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, says 1 Peter 5, 7. All right. What else can we say about people in this initial stage, the purgative way? And realize I spend most of my time in this talk in the purgative way because this is frankly where most of us are. It's really important we understand what this is. But as a person progresses, they eventually begin to focus on really giving themselves to our Lord. So you make an attempt to avoid sin and you fight against all those disordered desires that we have, that concupiscence that we have in our heart because we know these things keep us from truly loving God. So practically speaking, what do we mean by that? Well, you make a firm decision, you're no longer going to watch garbage on TV. You take a look at the music that you listen to. What books am I reading? What am I doing on the web in my free time? Beginners are, are really seeking after our Lord. You might even try and avoid that gossip in the coffee clutch, even though you got something really good you want to toss into that conversation. How hard it is to control their tongue. And as you progress, you will even start to not excuse yourself when your faults come into focus. And they will. Trust me, God will show you how sinful you are. And this is a very, very humbling experience. And it's a process that never stops because the more you grow in the spiritual life, you realize more and more the depth of your sin. You realize how much you don't deserve the love and the mercy of God. And you see this very clearly in the life of St. Paul. Early in his writings in Corinthians, he describes himself as the least of the apostles. Well, that's pretty good, Paul. I mean, you weren't one of the 12, you know, that was originally chosen. So I can see why he'd say that, you know. Then later in Ephesians, he writes, he is less than the least of all saints. Well, I mean, Paul, you wrote most of the New Testament. What's, I mean, you're getting a little carried away here. And then at the end of years of unflinching devotion to our Lord, you know what he wrote? I am the chief of sinners. And notice he doesn't say, I was the chief of sinners. He says, I am. So after giving everything he had to God, of making a complete, utter self-gift of his life and enduring things I hope to God none of us ever have to go through, he says, I am the chief of sinners. So his relationship with God had grown so deep, he'd come to a more full knowledge of this chasm that exists between us and God. And it's a chasm that can only be overcome by God's love and by his mercy. See, God reveals our sinfulness to us 
not so we get depressed, but so that we will run to him who is love and forgiveness and mercy. So that when we notice our faults, we'll want to correct them, not excuse them. Now, unfortunately, beginners in the spiritual life are all too famous for taking their eyes off of themselves and seeing the faults in other people. Did you see that dress Thelma was wearing? I could see her knees. <laughs> Tim was drinking his second beer. The game hadn't even started yet, for crying out loud. I wonder where that ended up. Jesus has very clear words for those of us engaged in these antics. You know what he says? Judge not, lest ye be judged. What are you doing looking at the speck in your brother's eye when you got a plank in your own? Now, one of the things we cannot avoid when you talk about spiritual growth is the topic of suffering. And I realize it's Chicago and the sun is shining, which is an anomaly. <laughs> and anybody who is serious about the spiritual life knows that they're going to suffer and that suffering plays a part in our spiritual growth. And everybody suffers. I don't care if you're Catholic, you're Protestant, pagan, Martian, it does not matter. You will suffer. Raise your hand if you're not. Exactly. Suffering always finds you, like an insurance salesman, right? You're never going to get away. But the big difference between Catholics and everybody else is how we view it and how it is that we deal with it. But what I do want to say is this. There are a couple of different kinds of suffering. There's the kind that God permits, so in his permissive will, and then there's the kind that we engage in through voluntary penance. And as Catholics, we cannot underestimate the power of penance. And the church doesn't let us, thanks be to God. We have different times in the liturgical year that are set up or geared more towards suffering and penance than others. And of course, Lent is the most penitential season. And why do we do this? Because we're masochists, obviously. No. <laughs> No, the liturgical calendar actually mimics the cycle of the spiritual life. So our calendar actually has a purpose for us. We begin to prepare ourselves for the coming of the Lord in Advent. And then we strip ourselves of attachment to this world so we can love God more in Lent. And then we're renewed in the resurrection of Easter and we glory in his spirit at Pentecost. And so we do this every year. Our liturgical calendar actually helps us grow toward God. So we act out our spiritual growth and then we are constantly renewed. Church knows what it's doing. Now back to this whole penance thing. Why is it so important for spiritual growth? My buddy Mike likes to say that it's, it's like losing weight. You know, back in your 20s and 30s, when you were like rock hard, all toned and all that, you could do anything. And then middle age hits and all of a sudden you got to wear jackets to cover up the little spare tire that's developed around the middle. They don't call that thing in your trunk a donut for nothing, right? <laughs> so what do you do at that point? Well, you squash your desire for food. You work out, right? You stop eating as much. You suffer a little. Why? So you get stronger. So you get healthier. It's the same thing in the spiritual life. So just like in our physical workouts, suffering plays a part in our spiritual conditioning. So it purges us of our vices, gets rid of our faults. And remember, gang, this isn't something that God imposed on us. This is something that we imposed on ourselves through sin. Started with Adam and Eve's really poor decision-making skills back in the Garden of Eden. Now it's a part of our lives. But the amazing thing is, is that God took this and he made this the path to life. And so as Catholics, joined to Jesus' mystical body, we can just make a simple act of the will. Jesus, I give this suffering to you, and now it becomes a powerful force for good. You want to put your prayer life on steroids? Start doing penance along with your prayer life. Because now you're acting in and through Jesus Christ. You're being like him again, which again is what the spiritual life is all about. And it sounds kind of crazy, but we should actually look forward to Lent because it forces us to kind of clean our rooms, so to speak. It's like a, a love-hate relationship, you know, that liquid antibiotic that tastes terrible, but you know it's going to heal you. That's how we have to approach this. And I actually find Lent funny at times, particularly in the way that we attempt to avoid it. If you're anything like the people in my house, whose names I shall not mention, the first thing you do when Ash Wednesday is coming up is you look at the calendar, where are the feast days? I got to know how long to last until the feast days. St. Joseph the worker, I got a job. St. Patrick's Day, yo, I feel Irish. 
In Chicago, everybody is Irish on St. Patrick's Day. I don't know if you guys have ever noticed this. But it's funny because we set up the specific criteria. And don't get me wrong, it's not like I've become overly rigid in my faith. In fact, I've gotten less rigid as time goes by because I realize how human I am. But it's hilarious, I think, when we set up specific criteria for our penance. You're kind of like, I'm giving up all TV, except for March Madness, Downton Abbey, and reruns of Burn Notice. Okay, God? I know people who will stay up until midnight on the eve of a vigil just to down a box of M&Ms. And I assure you, as a woman, because, of course, they gave up chocolate. <laughs> now, I am just as guilty of this. In fact, in some ways, I am more guilty than all the rest of you. In the last days of my RCIA progress <laughs> in Steubenville, Easter Vigil's approaching. I'm out to lunch at McDonald's with a couple of graduate school buddies of mine. And it was Friday. And so we stepped at the counter, and these guys grudgingly ordered the fish sandwich. Now, you don't have to be a health nut to know that's not really fish. Okay. I mean, these guys order, and I'm looking at these fried squares of death, and I'm thinking, oh no. You know, since I'm not yet technically Catholic and God doesn't want me to die before my confirmation, I don't think I should order that. I think I should order the Big Mac. And so that's what I did. So not only did my friends have to eat their breaded faux fish, but they had to watch and smell me eat 4,000 delicious calories of imitation meat product. What could they say? It was totally legal. But my problem was that I missed the point. See, penance and mortification are important because they teach us to focus on God and not on the, the sensible pleasures of this life. And people who work out know you've got to tear the muscle down so that it grows back. That's what penance does for us. Teresa of Avila says that beginners in the spiritual life have to develop a willed welcome to hardship. But remember, suffering's not the end, thanks be to God. Our Father in heaven is not some big meanie up there making us suffer. Are you mean when you make your children clean their room? No. In fact, oftentimes I reward them for it. I actually pay them off, right? Well, it's a little bit same in, in the spiritual life. God does the same thing. So in return for our striving for holiness, Beginners in the spiritual life will often discover that God rewards generous souls with what we call spiritual consolations. So little sensible pleasures from above, even as we are turning away from the sensible pleasures of below. So they're like little tastes of heaven. And most of the time, these spiritual consolations will occur while you are praying. So maybe you feel a peace of God like you've never experienced before. Maybe you're just overwhelmed with gratitude of how much God has done for you and the gifts that he's given to you. Maybe you have a palpable burning sensation of the Holy Spirit. You're on fire, literally. It comes in all kinds of different forms. But I want to say this. There is a danger in putting too much emphasis on these spiritual consolations as well. They might feel really good, but we have to remember this is not the end goal. The goal is God. And a lot of people fall into the trap of making this mistake. Before I became Catholic, I went to these spiritual conferences and I met this guy who literally sold just about everything he had. And he put his wife and his kids and then the remaining belongings in a station wagon. And he went from spiritual conference to spiritual conference to spiritual conference. And he was looking for the spiritual high. That's what he devoted his entire life to. It was like he was following the Grateful Dead from conference to conference. He wanted that high, but he missed the goal. Because these consolations are given by our Father as like a little piece of spiritual candy. It's a, just a taste of what it is that he has for us. A taste of what it is to come. And so that you don't fall into the trap of focusing on these spiritual consolations, the spiritual writers say then you come to a second conversion. So after you've gone the entire length of the purgative way, this initial stage, you move into what St. John of the Cross calls the passive purification of the senses or the night of sense, the second conversion. So now, instead of spiritual delights, you start to experience spiritual dryness. Anyone ever had that before? Yeah, amen, right? So prayer starts to be a little hard. You're like, hey God, I don't feel your presence anymore. Where'd you go? What's going on here? And realize 
This is not the same. St. John is not talking about the, the human roller coaster of emotion or spiritual laziness. He is assuming in this that you are making spiritual progress in these characteristics that I'm describing here. In fact, what happens is your desire for righteousness actually starts to grow. And when you stop feeling the presence of God, you start to get a little worried sometimes. Wait, am I doing the right thing? Because I'm not feeling God the way that I used to. And you start to question yourself a little bit. Meditation becomes hard. And lots of times when you're in prayer, you have this desire to just kind of set the stuff you're reading or you're praying over down and you focus on God if you're in an adoration chapel or you focus on him in your mind if you're not. Have you ever had this experience? Because at the end of the purgative way, the spiritual writers say is actually the place where you are beginning to enter into the contemplative state, believe it or not. Okay, so you are moving into contemplation here. And what's happening is, is that God is preparing you to move into the second stage of the spiritual life. So you are starting to grow up. And he's teaching you to seek him for who he is instead of those sensible pleasures with which you had associated your relationship with him previously. So this second conversion is all about getting rid of self-love. Now, why is this necessary? Because even though you're growing you're still immature. Hey, you still have trouble looking past your own needs. The world still revolves around Matt, revolves around me. So you're developing this fervent love of God, but you still love yourself more. So God seeks to purify us of this self-love by taking away some of the sensible pleasures that he'd given to us in the first stage. So it starts to get harder. Like when school stopped being about coloring and snack time, and now you have to start doing homework. So in this second conversion, what's happening is God is intensifying that conversion that you experienced when you first entered into the purgative way, when you first entered into the state of grace. So he's uprooting the deeper weeds of sin in your life. This is kind of akin to junior high or high school. You're on the cusp of adulthood. So your spiritual voice is starting to change. Your spiritual body is developing. And yeah, you still do dumb stuff, but you're starting to really mature. And at this point, a lot of people stop. They refuse to grow up spiritually. You know people like this in the natural world too. These are people who are perpetual children. They never fully assume the responsibilities of adulthood. Maybe you got one of them living in your basement. I don't know. But it's the same in the spiritual life. Okay? These people stop maturing. They never become fully functioning spiritual adults. And as such, you miss out on all the benefits of adult life. Some of you are like, well, sheesh, man, I don't know if you noticed, but being an adult isn't always cupcakes and brownies. Sometimes I wouldn't mind being a kid again. Oh yeah? How many of you want to go back to junior high? <laughs> Puberty, awkward dances, trying to figure out how to get that padlock unlocked so you don't have to go to detention, okay? <laughs> no, thank you. Right? I wouldn't want to do that again. So what happens? We undergo a second conversion so we learn to grow up. And the most important thing you have to remember at this stage is you do not stop. You never stop seeking our Lord. It doesn't matter what you feel or what you don't feel. And if you continue and you persevere, your senses will submit more and more to the spirit. And then you gradually move out of the beginner stage into the second stage, into the illuminative way. Whew. You made it. The second stage of the spiritual life is all about falling in love. So you start to love God, not for what he does for you, but for who he is in himself. And as you focus more on God, you start to lose interest in the things of this world. And I don't mean you don't care. Rather, you just don't desire the things of this world like you did in the initial stage of the spiritual life. And I'm sure you've experienced this at one stage or another of your life. You've begun to realize that things are just things. They can't satisfy you. Your car, just a piece of metal that gets you from point A to point B. Maybe it's got leather seats, right? Who cares? But you lose your taste for this world and you start to become detached from it. And some of you are thinking, Matt, I don't want to lose my taste for this world. I got to live in it and I want to enjoy it. I don't disagree. Life is meant for living to the fullest, even in this physical world. And I think the Catholicism gets this more than any other religion because ours is a very tactile faith, right down to our sacraments. We approach God through this physical world. 
He wants us to enjoy this life. He's the one who made all this stuff in the beginning. But you know, at the end of the day, as amazing as this world is, it's never, ever going to satisfy you. You know this. In the higher stages of the spiritual life, you start to lose your interest and taste in this world because you realize it's a foretaste of what it is to come. Eye has not seen nor ear heard nor the heart of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. This world is just a foretaste of the glory that is to come. And what is to come is going to blow your mind. Amen? Amen. Now, detachment from this world also helps us in another way too. It actually helps us to love other people more. Because the more you detach yourself from the world, the more you get rid of self-love, you start to put the interests and needs of other people in front of your own. You start to love more like Jesus Christ. And interestingly, this love actually even comes into play when you sin. We all know sin's going to occur all the way up until the day you die. In fact, I was in confession to an Irish priest not long ago, and he said, Sonny, you'll keep sinning three days after you're dead. <laughs> but the difference is, is that the kind of sin you commit now is normally not premeditated. Okay? It's venial sins. I don't want to call it smaller sin. There's no such thing as small sin. It's all an offense against God. But it's not premeditated mortal sin most of the time. So in this stage, you are making a conscious effort to move toward God. You want to strive for holiness. And so the, the kind of sin that happens is different. Typically, it's venial. Typically, it deals with deeper issues in our spiritual life. Pride, vanity, lack of patience. Any of these things sound familiar? Now, it's still very possible for a person in the illuminative way to fall into a state of mortal sin. But when that happens, what normally follows is a very contrite admission of sin. And our sorrow is greater because we realize more deeply what it is we've lost. And so we're more quick to repent and we do so more deeply. Remember how bitterly St. Peter wept when he denied our Lord. Well, like Peter's, our sorrow is so much greater because now we understand our relationship to Almighty God as his children. We're not servants fearing punishment. Rather, it kills us to let us know that we let our father down. Remember when you were a kid and you knew you were going to get spanked and instead one of your parents turns to you and says, I am so disappointed in you. Oh, you might as well just pull the knife out of my heart right now. That was awful. And just like you don't go back to being a kid in the natural world, even when you do something stupid, you don't go back to go in the spiritual life either, even if you fall into grave sin in this second stage. The only way that happens is if you just chuck the entire spiritual life. You say, I'm going back to a world of death and darkness. And growth is so powerful at this point in the spiritual life that as crazy as it sounds, people in the higher stages of the spiritual life actually embrace and dare I say, enjoy trials and suffering. You heard me right. Some of you are thinking, man, guess I'm not as holy as I thought I was, right? <laughs> not sure I want to be that holy, Matt. Enjoy suffering? How can this be? Well, it's kind of like Kool-Aid. Remember when you were a kid and you actually liked to drink Kool-Aid? And you were in your backyard hanging out and you're like, wouldn't it be awesome if I could just yell, hey, Kool-Aid, like one of those commercials and some dude in a big pitcher and red leotard would come busting through your back fence, pour you a nice tall glass of red dye number five with high fructose <laughs> corn syrup. That would be awesome. And standing there in your backyard, sipping your tall, cool glass of liquid, sugary death, you would look over at the adults drinking wine. And you're like, how in the world can they drink that stuff? Disgusting. What are they thinking? Well, now that I have matured, sort of, I enjoy the, the Malbecs, the Pinot Noirs, right? The Cabernet Sauvignon. They even sound cool. This 2006 vintage possesses hints of blackberry, oak, and maple syrup with a faint vanilla finish offset by strong tannins and burned rubber. Right? <laughs> Who writes that stuff? Imagine if your guardian angel did that for you. Rex comes from the excellent harvest of 1963, but possesses a hint of vanity sprinkled with pride and an envious aftertaste. <laughs> Not so good. 
My point is that some of the things you think you will never like actually become desirable the more you progress in the spiritual life. See, because of sin, the things that lead us to God are contrary to our current fallen state. They're acquired tastes. Well, it's the same in the spiritual life, particularly with suffering. Because it's leading you to God and you know it, you start to crave it because God is everything. And after you've developed to a certain point, you, you realize the shallowness of living for this world and you're really striving for holiness on a daily basis and you're engaged in virtue and, and a deep life of prayer and you're feeling the presence of God, you come to a crisis. And this is probably the most difficult thing that you will endure in your spiritual life. This is the transition from the illuminative way into the unitive way, from the second into the third and final stage. And this is the final rite of passage into spiritual adulthood. Why is it a crisis? Because the St. John of the Cross tells us this is the purification of the spirit, popularly known as the dark night of the soul. It even sounds scary. Like Darth Vader should be introducing the dark night of the soul. The dark night of the soul is this feeling of abandonment by God that occurs when people have reached the higher stages of prayer and the spiritual life. So this is the final purging process where we learn to seek God no matter how distant he seems from us. So in the earlier stages of the spiritual life, you got it going on, right? You feel the presence of God. Lots of times prayer is easy. Things are good. I feel you, O Lord. In the dark night, he disappears. He's not gone, but you don't feel him anymore at all. The dark night is us being united to Calvary. That's what this is. Remember, the goal of life is to be united with Jesus Christ. So the feeling of abandonment that we experience in the dark night of the soul unites us to the cross of Jesus Christ. So along with Christ on the cross, we cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken? All the while secure in the hope of our deliverance because we've matured to this point in the spiritual life, knowing God is going to save us even though we don't feel his presence. That's what the dark night of the soul is. Mother Teresa wrote about how she experienced this so acutely. Many others have as well, though a lot of people don't. 